Okay, so good afternoon. I'm Wataru Yasaki from the University of Tokyo and chairing the next three talks. And the first talk is <laughs> it's a proceeding talk. Oh, it's here. Uh, yeah. So it's going to be uh, provided by Dinity Sumana Vera from Monash University, Australia. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diniti. I'm a final year PhD student from Monash University Faculty of IT. So today I'm going to talk about how we took a classical problem in the field, which is protein sequence alignment, uh, and cast it in information theory. So as many of you know, protein sequence alignment answers two main questions. First one is whether two proteins are related to each other. And second answers, if so, how exactly are they related? So usually uh, the answer to the second question comes in the form of an alignment like this. Uh, as you can see, it's actually one-to-one -one correspondence between the amino acid uh, residues of the proteins. And uh, you can see that it can be represented as a three-state string over matches, insertions, and deletions. Uh, and that allows us to view it as a state machine as well. So to generate such an alignment, the common criteria, as you know, is uh, usually uh, involving uh, choosing a substitution scoring matrix and then gap penalty parameters. And it also involves a search algorithm to optimize the scoring scheme and find the best uh, or the optimal alignment. But there are some notable uh, shortcomings presently in the, uh, the field. The first one is that uh, these uh, choices for the substitution scoring matrices and gap penalty parameters are often ad hoc. And there is also this disconnect between choosing the uh, substitution scores and gap penalties, uh, especially when quantifying these related and unrelated parts separately. And moreover, the sequence alignment programs are finding it very challenging to establish, establish a relationship when uh, the sequences have heavily diverged, especially in the twilight zone. Uh, and then uh, finally, we see that most sequence alignment programs actually report only a single optimal alignment, uh, overlooking many other closely competing alignments. So what we wanted to do was uh, to address these shortcomings in a single consistent and probabilistic framework. For that, we use minimum message length inference. So MML is actually a statistical inductive inference framework um, proposed and introduced by uh, a distinguished computer scientist from Australia, late Professor Chris Wallace in 1960s. So it actually uh, provides us a way to come up with a good trade-off between model complexity and model fit. And also, it links lossless compression uh, with uh, losses compression with model selection. So in a nutshell, what happens here is that, uh, sorry. Uh, so the framework actually uh, assumes an imaginary transmission between two parties, a sender and a receiver. So the sender wants to send some hypothesis and the data jointly as a message to the receiver. And this is done by a two-part message. Where the first part is the message of the hypothesis information. And the second part refers to the data given the hypothesis information. And the sender needs to ensure that all the information uh, which is required for decoding this message at the receiver side has to be encoded in the process as well. So this is realized by combining the Bayes theorem with Shannon information theory. As you know, the Bayes theorem in its product form is the joint probability of a hypothesis H and data D. And uh, separately, Shannon information theory gives us the optimal encoding length of an event E. And if we combine these two together, we can restate the Bayes theorem in this form as a two-part message length, which actually realizes the early imaginary transmission. So this IH is actually the information content associated with sending the, in, uh, the hypothesis. And then the second part is the information content associated with data given hypothesis information. And then the paradigm is actually to select the best model under the scheme of things by minimizing this total message length. So what we did was we formulated the protein sequence alignment problem under this framework by introducing two models, a null model and an alignment model. So you can see if we have two sequences S and T, the null model simply uh, 
assumes that there is no evolutionary relatedness in uh, between these proteins and therefore encodes these sequences independent to each other. So for each sequence, we have to encode the amino acid residues uh, associated. And for that, we can use null probabilities estimated over some proteome data. So for this, we use the uniprot human proteome. And then you can see that uh, the total co uh, message length associated is actually the summation of the individual uh, message lengths of sending this uh, raw data, raw sequence data. And then the alignment model is where we define uh, an evolutionary relationship between the two proteins uh, in, uh, in the form of an alignment. And then we try to utilize the alignment information when sending these sequences. So the first part, it's actually two part, as you can see. The first part is sending the alignment hypothesis. And the second part relates to sending the sequence information uh, using the alignment information. So uh, finally, the total message length associated is the summation of the two parts. So now that we have an alignment model, uh, how do we actually accept or reject an alignment? This can be done by uh, using the inherent uh, acceptance rejection criteria that is given by MML paradigm. Uh, it is actually the lossless compression. So if we take uh, the difference between the uh, null model and the alignment model, we can actually uh, check if there's a compression gain. If so, we can accept the alignment, and otherwise we can reject the alignment. So now I will uh, look at uh, the first, uh, how do we uh, encode this uh, alignment model uh, parts. The first part is encoding the hypothesis itself. And as you can remember, this can be viewed as a three-state string over matches, insertions, and deletions. And therefore, we can view it as a finite state machine uh, of nine state transmission, uh, transmission probabilities associated. And also, we have some properties involved. Uh, there is a symmetry uh, which we, where we treat insertions and deletions symmetrically. And also, for each state, the outgoing edges have to add up to one, ensuring their probabilities. And this brings down the finite state machine into having only three free parameters. So one free parameter is associated with the match state, uh, where uh, this is the probability of m given m. Uh, and it can be represented as a point on a unit one simplex. And for I state, there are two uh, other free parameters associated, the probability of I given I and M given I, uh, where we can represent this as a point uh, a vector on a unit two simplex. So after encoding, uh, we also uh, have to infer these uh, free parameters, uh, which I will talk later on. And then the second part of the message involves sending the sequence data. So for that, we uh, take the related parts and unrelated parts. For related part encoding, uh, we can use a probability substitution matrix like PAM, Blossom, or JTT. But there is an unknown parameter associated, which is the evolutionary distance n between them. So we have to actually uh, infer that as well. And for unrelated parts, we can uh, simply use the null probabilities that we use for the null model. So with that, now what we wanted to address was the disconnect between the quantification of the related parts and the unrelated parts. So uh, as we saw that the substitution scores and gap penalties are treated uh, independently, but if we can actually connect it in a, the probabilistic model uh, in terms of the evolutionary distance and the three state three parameters, uh, we will be able to connect these things together. So for that, what we did was we uh, uh, approach was to actually estimate the evolutionary distance as a function, uh, sorry, estimate the free parameters as a function of the evolutionary distance. For that, we use Dirichlet probabilistic modeling because the three-state string allows us to uh, use uh, this as a conjugate prior, uh, uh, which is widely used for multi-state probability distributions. So for this, we use a reliable data uh, set of structural alignments over around 118,000 uh, SCOP domain pairs. What we did was we inferred or estimated the optimal n for each structural alignment, and then we grouped them uh, according to the n, and this was done from one to 1,000 of n. Uh, and then for each group, we estimated the unit one simplex related and unit two sim uh, simplex related free parameters separately. Uh, so these are the, uh, the estimates that we obtained for the unit one simplex. This is for probability of m given m. As you can see, when the evolutionary distance is increasing, the, the mode under the distribution is also decreasing. 
So probability of m given m actually controls the expected match block of an alignment, and uh, we can expect that this to be happening. And as this plot explains, around 400, up to 400, you can see a linear decrease. Uh, but in, uh, right after that, you can see that it's kind of flattening out, and we believe that this is because of the limitation of the PAM N matrix, because as it reaches the stationary distribution, it loses its ability to uh, identify uh, or dis uh, distinguish between uh, substitutions. So similarly, we obtained two uh, simplex estimates as well for probability of I given I and uh, M given I. You can see that the probability of uh, a gap is actually linearly increasing. Uh, with uh, the evolutionary distance, and then it flattens out uh, for the same reason as uh, before. And these are the, uh, the visualizations of the Dirichlet uh, distributions associated. Now that we have uh, defined the alignment model, what we want to do is find the uh, best alignment under the given scheme of things, and also estimate the optimal parameters. So for this, we use an iterative ex expectation maximization-like approach, where first we run a dynamic programming algorithm similar to the Gotos al uh, alignment algorithm uh, to find the best alignment uh, given the initial PAMN and the associated, uh, associated uh, state machine parameters which we estimated earlier. And then uh, for, we f take the optimal under that, and then we fix that and estimate, uh, re-estimate the optimal n, and then take the associated state machine parameters. We do redo this again uh, until convergence. Uh, so you can see that the three metri history matrices we use, uh, where uh, each cell is actually referring to the optimal alignment of the corresponding uh, prefixes of the two sequences. Now, if we, we, now that we have an optimal alignment, what if this is not the best alignment? And what if it does not be the null model? In that case, we want to know whether these two sequences are actually evolutionarily related in some unspecified manner. For that, what we did was we utilized the total law, uh, the law of probability, which gives us a way to look at these in an unspecified way. So it's this marginal probability between two sequences, whether they, have, they, have, they are evolutionarily related in some unspecified way. So the probability, marginal probability is simply the, we can actually take it as in, by integrating over the entire alignment space. And we did this in the information space. Uh, which provided a overview and also a way to uh, find out uh, what's the unspecified alignment model. And for finding that, what we did was a similar DP approach, but this time we have to take the sum over all possible alignments. And in the log space, this becomes uh, information space, this becomes the log summation of the exponentials, as you can see. And the each uh, uh, cell of the history matrix now refers to whether uh, the prefixes of the alignment, uh, the sequences are related in some unspecified manner. So this also allows us to visualize the entire alignment landscape. Uh, this is an alignment landscape over the marginal probabilities in the information space. Each cell, uh, so what we did was we ran the uh, unspecified alignment model in its forward direction and then backward direction, and we stitch them together. And then we can get for each cell, what's the marginal probability associated with uh, having the suffixes and prefixes related to each other in some unspecified manner. So, and then you can see that there are some regions which are more probable in its unspecified relationship, the bluish regions here, and you can explore different alignment paths in this uh, visualization landscape and see what is the best plausible one uh, in the context. So with this framework, we tested it with uh, seven other widely used uh, sequence alignment programs. And uh, we did this for the optimal mode and uh, the marginal mode separately over two benchmarks. So the first benchmark is a remote autolog data set from literature. And as you can see, uh, the MML optimal is uh, generally doing OK with identifying whether uh, sequence pairs are evolutionary related or not. Uh, but the clear winner is actually the MML marginal mode uh, with around 95%. And this is for a much difficult data set. Uh, we took submarked twilight data set, twilight zone data set, uh, around 10,000 pairs. And then uh, we can clearly see that uh, the marginal mode is actually uh, identifying around 35% of the time. And rest of them, uh, even uh, our optimal mode is actually not being able to recognize much. 
uh, but significant uh, increase of accuracy is gained by the marginal mode. So with that, in conclusion, we actually propose a statistical inference framework uh, using information theory to do the protein sequence alignment, which is a different perspective. And there we try to uh, uh, address all the shortcomings that I mentioned, including the disconnect between the, uh, the substitutions cause and gap penalties. And then uh, we also uh, did unsupervised parameter estimation, and it allows uh, a good model uh, complexity versus fit trade-off as well. Uh, and also it gives you a way to explore different closely competing alignments and see for yourself what are the relationships, with, uh, possible relationships. Uh, the program is actually available as open source uh, at this address. And um, on that note, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and I, I would like to uh, thank the uh, ISMB CCB organizers for giving me this opportunity to present our work. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for uh, this great work. Uh, I was wondering if you had any potential views about uh, multiple sequence alignment uh, yeah. with this kind of uh, approach, if there is something that can be done? Yeah, at the moment we haven't looked at the multiple sequence alignment, but that is a really great direction to go at. So what we wanted to do was first formulate the pairwise sequence alignment problem uh, for, uh, formally in the paradigm, and then we can extend the framework furthermore with the multiple sequence alignment. So that is definitely the direction that we are going to look at in the future. Nice. I'm, I'm going to follow up on that idea, and uh, I'm just thinking, you said that you can score fixed alignments, is that correct? Oh, you mean the landscapes? Yeah. It's, so when you yes. have, so in other words, if you had alternative alignments, yes. like say pairs from a multiple sequence alignment, you could score those, is that correct? Oh, yeah, so like if, we, if, if it is uh, in that space, maybe we can take different pairs and then uh, different alignments, we can actually see it in the alignment uh, space and that would be a good direction to look at the different alignments and see what is a kind of an, a consolidated alignment uh, for that purpose. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. That's a so great, that's, wonderful it, ability. That's, a great uh, that's a great suggestion. Thank you.